Our guest today is a professor in the School of Divinity here at Cairn. I've been privileged to call him a colleague for the last several years. Prior to that, privileged to call him a professor. He's actually been a professor at Cairn for 31 years teaching Bible and theology. He was educated here at Cairn University, then went to Dallas Theological Seminary for his THM and Westminster Theological Seminary for his PhD. He also serves as pastor of Graceway Bible Church in Hamilton, New Jersey, married with two grown sons who are also graduates of Cairn. Dr. Emmons, it's a delight to have you here today. It's great to be here. Thanks, John. Now, you have devoted uh, a great deal of your life here to Christian higher education, biblical higher education. But I want to go back and, and find out a little bit about your background. Did you grow up in a Christian family? Yes, I did. My parents came to know the Lord at about the time I was born. I had an older brother who was two years older than me who was killed in an accident at home uh, about a month before I was born. And that sent my parents searching for answers which led to them coming to Christ. And so I grew up in a Christian home, can't remember ever being in a different context. Mm -hmm. Grew up going to church? Yes. All of that. Was there a certain point where you thought, uh, maybe in your teenage years or something, that you wanted to study Bible more? Because you came, you came here um, as an undergrad. I came here uh, second. Oh, okay. I, I went to another school first. Okay. I was going through a period at the end of my high school years and into my college, early college years, where I was rebelling against the form, I think now, the form of my parents' faith. I knew I was a Christian. I knew I was born again. But I wasn't interested in the shape and the activities and the restrictions as I perceived them. So I went to a, a school that had some kind of a Christian reputation but wasn't really Christian mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for two and a half years. And in the th middle of that second year, God began to deal with me, brought me back into relationship with him in an active, aggressive way, and then a year later transferred to PCB at the time mm -hmm. when it was downtown. So I transferred in in the middle of my college career. And when you transferred in, obviously the Lord had been working in your life. Were you also transferring in with an aim to go into pastoral ministry? Not initially. I just decided I wanted to study God's Word. I wanted to know the Word. I thought I would be a businessman uh, going back into the family business and um, serving the Lord in the local church as an educated layman. Okay. So was it during your time at PCB that that changed? Yes. As I came toward the end of that time, I realized I wanted to know more about the Word. Mm -hmm. And so I took the next step, headed to Dallas Seminary as a way of enhancing and just seeking what, what God would have for me. Now, had you met your wife at this point? I met her the first month I was here. Oh, all right. Um, I tried to play some basketball in those days. Okay. And Fran was a cheerleader. Uh -huh. And I saw this cheerleader and I thought, I'm definitely going to stick with the team for a little <laughs> while. And it was maybe a month or so that we started dating. Uh -huh. And it was a year and four months later that we got married. So you were married before you went to Dallas? Yes. Okay. So you both went down to Dallas together. And at that point, you know you want to study the Bible more. But were you thinking pastoral ministry at that point? Or were you thinking teaching? I wasn't sure. I thought I wanted to be a teacher. But the further that I went in seminary, the more, for me, my learning resonated with those who had been pastors. Mm -hmm. People like Dwight Pentecost, mm -hmm. Howard Hendricks, um, Haddon Robinson, who had had at least time in a pastoral ministry. And that nudged me in that direction as I came toward the end. I had to deal with whether the Lord wanted me to go overseas or as a missionary or something else. But in the final analysis, I just felt led into the pastoral ministry. So, You mentioned a couple guys who taught at Dallas. Um, when you look back at your time here and then your time at Dallas, who are some of the key figures, the key teachers who really had a formative influence on your life? When I was here, it was um, 
Clarence Mason, John Kaywood, uh, Gordon Sepperly, and John McGahee. They had a profound impact on me. Uh, all of those men were Dallas grads themselves, mm -hmm. and that's one of the reasons I went there. Mm -hmm. When I got there, I took everything I could take under Dwight Pentecost, mm -hmm. under Charles Ryrie, uh, Haddon Robinson, and um, Howard Hendricks. For me, I, it was just a resonating with those uh, with those men and their mm -hmm. style of teaching and what they were communicating, and um, I just felt like I was there at the peak of the history of Dallas in some ways. Yeah, for me at least, a lot of well-known names. Yeah. Um, were there were there particular things that you remember? learning there that really resonated with you? I mean, that, so the men themselves, you just connected with their teaching, but were there were there kind of particular strains that have stayed with you, particular emphases? With Howard Hendricks, everybody took his How to Study the Bible. Uh -huh. You know, it was the introductory course, and that has been a part of my life ever since. It just opened the book up to me. And one of the things I've tried to do in all of my years here at Cairn is to do the same thing for the students mm -hmm. here, to teach them how to get into God's Word for themselves. With Dwight Pentecost, it was the coordination, the bringing together of the overall picture of the Scriptures. He just helped me put it all together. He helped me to see, without getting lost in the academic details, to see that big picture. And that's been, a, I think, a mark of what I've tried to do over the years. Yeah, and I, I think if we ask people, they would say that. And uh, sorry to interrupt, but I think right, if we ask fine. people, they would yeah. say that. They would say you taught many, many people here how to study the Bible, and right. then also the big picture. But go talk about then, Dr. Ryrie. Then I was I was challenged by Dr. Ryrie. He has a way, as you know, of really simplifying things, mm -hmm. taking complex things, and bringing it down to our level. And I've always tried to do that as well, to, to make it as clear as possible for people. Um, and I think the pastoral ministry has been a great compliment in doing that because you're forced to do that in the pulpit week after week after week. And so I just see teaching and preaching as extremely complimentary in the process for me. I remember as a student, one time you said, you were a professor, I was a student, and you said that what you were teaching, a lot of what you were teaching in Intro to the Bible were the things that you did on a weekly basis in your, mm -hmm. I think you said your first four years of pastoral ministry. That th those years, it was, I, I gather that was at, right after seminary? Yes. And, and what you did was then what you were teaching so many of us to do. That's correct. And really longer than that, um, I felt like when I came out of seminary, what I did was to take the stuff that, that Dr. Hendricks was teaching and just I just put that into practice. And every morning in the study, um, I just put myself into the Word. I didn't allow any other interruptions. It was just study every morning. And then I would do the other pastoral ministry and so forth beyond that. And that went on really through the length of that first pastorate, 11 years, and then on into the rest of pastoral ministry so that I still do almost all of that. I still create the charts. If you came to my church on Sunday, mm -hmm. we had a chart for half a chapter of Revelation in the bulletin mm -hmm. for people to study all week mm -hmm. in preparation for next week's sermon. So I'm trying to get people to do that both in the classroom here and also in the local church. Oh, it's it's legendary here. So, um, <laughs> yeah, and I remember, and I remember you talking about. So, so you still use that. I mean, that's actually a, a pretty amazing thing that mm -hmm. these tools have n didn't just engage you at the time, but they've actually sustained you mm -hmm. through a long term ministry. I think that says a tremendous amount. So, um, after Dallas, pastor it. Uh, yes. Where where was that? I was in Newburgh, New York in a church by the name of Leptondale Bible Church for almost 11 years. And then we transitioned to Southern California mm -hmm. to a little town called Yucaipa. It was uh, First Baptist Church of Yucaipa for three and a half years. And then we came back here to uh, PCB Cairn mm -hmm. in 1985. 
Was that a was that a difficult transition or a difficult decision for you to leave pastoral ministry and come back here? Obviously, this place had had a great influence on you. Was that sort of the draw? That was a big part of it. Um, we we came from the pastoral ministry. It, it, what I thought was that with the pastoral ministry was I can't really push people. I can't make them do what I know they need to do. And so the classroom gives me the opportunity to do that. I can make assignments mm -hmm. and the students have to do it. So I thought, well, going into the teaching realm would be ideal. What I found in the teaching realm was that while I could make students do it for a semester, I I couldn't extend that because I might not have them the next semester. Mm -hmm. So what I found is both areas have their strength. But yeah, that's that's how we got here. Um, we just we had a love for for PCB Karen that continued through all those years. I served on the alumni council. I was on the board of trustees, and then when it came time to make that transition, uh, it seemed like a natural to come here. What have been some of the uh, most encouraging things you've seen in this in this ministry that you've had here? Because I, 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 there are a lot of students who or former students who who say to me and say to you, I'm sure, and to others that we, we hear it a lot that 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 maybe that early class they had with you or a couple classes they had with you really did set the trajectory of their own life in ministry. Mm -hmm. um, what what have you seen as some of the the, the encouraging fruits of, a, of a, a ministry at a place like this? I think it's the longevity of that relationship with students. Every once in a while I'll have a student who'll call me or write and express appreciation for the techniques that they learned or the things that they learned here and to realize that we have a part in building the Church of Jesus Christ all around the world in the work that we do here. Uh, Lord willing, in October, I anticipate being in France with Bill and Christy Campbell, mm -hmm. graduates of the school here, that we, as a church support, that I personally had the opportunity to teach, in part, and we have maintained that relationship, and it's like, it's, it's just like an extension of, of what we're doing here. And so that's part of the motivation to, to provide that kind of teaching. What would you tell um, someone who's preparing for the ministry today? Obviously, a lot has changed. Churches, in many ways, look different. They feel different. Uh, a lot of, lot of different issues have emerged. But, but you said earlier that some of the things you did early on have just sustained you throughout mm -hmm. it. So mm -hmm. how, how, what kind of advice would you give to someone uh, new or thinking about the ministry or, or new to the ministry? One of the things that I have felt for a long time is that Christians, people, whether they're church people or students in school like this, what we need is not theories. We need God's Word. People need to know what does the Word of God say about this issue or that issue or that area of life. And so the job of the teacher, the job of the pastor, is to lead people into the Word. And so I would say you need to know the Word. You need to know how to study the Word because you can't get all the answers in a short period of time. So you need the methods to be able to do that. And then you need to take people into that process in studying God's Word and helping them understand it, helping them study it, learn it for themselves. I think probably anyone who's had you and anyone who knows you would would testify that that's exactly the kind of thing you drive your students towards. Mm -hmm. It's been really consistent. Last question. If you were speaking to um, someone who is 18, 19, early 20s, looking at, at, at college, maybe not necessarily sure they want to go into ministry, maybe like you thinking about family business mm -hmm. or something like that, what do you think and what have you seen uh, as the value of biblical higher education, studying the Bible in a university setting? I think first and foremost, every student or potential student has an obligation to give God 
the first shot at his life. I think a student ought to pursue biblical education first. It doesn't have to be a full four years, but I think every student should proceed down that road as he or she pursues the plan of God for his or her life and allow God to say, no, I don't want you to do that. I want you to be a lawyer. Or no, I don't want you to do this. I want you to be a doctor. That's been my argument from day one, that we must give Jesus the first call on our lives. We have a responsibility and obligation to serve him. And if we trust him with our lives, he will do what's best for us. He will do what gives us the most fulfillment and enjoyment. And he will use us in the best way that we were intended by God to be used. So you give God the first opportunity. You give him the right of saying, no, I don't want you to be a pastor or missionary or youth worker or, or Christian social worker or whatever. And if he wants to take you in another direction, then you can feel very confident in that. And it will never be wasted. The biblical education that you get, the context of developing a worldview in which Jesus is center and most important will never hurt you. And it will never diminish your employable skills, your education, or your usefulness in life. Dr. Emmons, thanks so much. It's a privilege to be your colleague and friend, and thanks Thank you. for your time today. My, my pleasure as well. Thanks.